all are at Romans chapter uh, 15. All right, I'm going to begin reading at, reading at verse number 1, and then I'm going to read down to verse number 7, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. It reads like this from the English Standard Version. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Some of y'all thinking this is going to go left real quick, ain't it? <laughs> Thank you, Lady Kia and Sister Lisa, for standing for God's word. I know the rest of y'all just sat down, but if you don't mind, let's stand and honor God's word one more time. You won't have to stand up for another 35, 40, 50, 60 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my joke, Sister Paula. We who are strong have an obligation, an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his or her own good, to build him or her up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together, somebody say together, together. you may be with one voice, that you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of of God. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Verse 6 again says that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. As you take your seats, I would like to title, as you take your seats, I would like to title our time together from this passage, I would like to title this sermon, Togetherness for the glory of God. Amen. Togetherness for the glory of God. I've picked up a phrase recently. It's a Latin phrase. that says, always we begin again. <laughs> and that's what we do on this morning, Vision Sunday. Earlier this year, I was listening to a podcast about people who, in response to the horrific events of 9-11, they actually ended up finding God through all of that chaos. And eventually they became a part of the body of Christ, following Jesus themselves. Even in the midst of the darkness of that day, they were able to find the light of Jesus and follow him. As I was listening to the podcast, I learned about yet another heroic occasion, though, that happened on 9-11 in New York City. I don't know about you, but it still amazes me that although there was so much trauma and loss and tragedy and heartbreak and death on that day, that rising up out of all of that chaos came countless stories of heroism, heroism, courage, strength, and unity. One of the stories of unity and people pulling together and binding together to work together that I hadn't heard about was one that happened with thousands of people who were stranded on the shoreline and literally right up against the seawall of the Hudson River in an area in downtown Manhattan south of the Twin Towers that's called Battery Park. Battery Park is located in the southernmost part of Manhattan, south of where the Twin Towers were. So I learned about it because of this couple who they weren't believers yet, and at the time, they were living in an apartment in Battery Park. And when they were forced to evacuate their apartment, they could not go north, because had they gone north, they would have been going into the destruction of the Twin Towers. So the only thing that they could do was to go south. But the problem is, is that they couldn't go too far south, because as they kept going south, the Hudson River was right there. And so... Thousands of people who lived and worked in that area, they basically were trapped and hemmed in 
between the ten, twin, twin Towers on the north and the Hudson River on the south. They couldn't go any further south because they would have been in the river. And so they were trapped, hemmed in. And after the two twin towers had collapsed, this couple, who eventually became Christians, along with thousands of others who were down in that area, they were covered in the debris from the towers. They were exhausted. The wife said at one point she saw a guy who had a suit on and obviously had gone to work that day and the bottom of his pants legs had just been chopped off. They were exhausted. They were rattled by everything that was unfolding and they thought that they were stranded and had nowhere to go. They felt helpless. They couldn't go north and they couldn't go any further south. The wife said that she actually saw, it's getting a little bit of cold, a little cold in here. She said she actually saw some people jumping over the railing into the Hudson River because the governor's Allen is a probably for an amateur, pretty good swimmer, it would, be, it would take them 45 minutes to swim to Governor's Island. And some of them were going to try to do that. That's how helpless that they felt. This couple said that while they were standing there, they started to see boats coming up to the shoreline. And this wasn't an area where boats normally docked. And so literally, the boats came up to the shoreline because the Coast Guard knew that there were thousands of people who were stuck in this area at the southernmost tip of Manhattan. And they called out on the radios to all marine time of people who owned boats or were boat boaters in New Jersey and New York. And they said, listen, people are stuck down there. Would you go take your boat and help transport them across the river or to wherever you can take them? And so literally these boats show up where there was no place for them to dock at all. And what ended up happening is that people were actually hoisting themselves over this black railing and jumping down into the boats. There were boats of all kinds showing up. There were tugboats that showed up, ferry boats that showed up, charter boats that showed up that would take people around and show them things. There were, there were expensive 40-foot yachts that showed up to help out. There were even small boats. You know those little small boats that just had that little engine in the back? Even those boats showed up. In the byline of the Smithsonian Magazine article that read, um, wrote about it, they said, amidst the terror and tragedy of that day came these everyday heroes who answered the call when the city needed the most. These people heard the call and they decided to go help. It's believed to be the largest water evacuation in history. The boats would pick people up, take people, some to New Jersey across the Hudson River, but then some would take, would take them up to North uh, Manhattan, some to Governor's Island. But as soon as they would drop them off, they would come back and get another load because they answered the call. It's remarkable how they came together. They used something that was at an advantage for them, a strength, if you will, to help those who were helpless, to help those who were at a disadvantage. They used the advantage that they had. They used the strength that they had, the boats that they had, to help those who couldn't help themselves. But what happened in Battery Park on that fretful day of 9-11, 2001, it can serve as an illustration of this grand and glorious vision that Paul lays out in our passage this morning from Romans chapter 15. In this grand and glorious vision that Paul lays out, he gives us a framework for how those who are in a position to help can leverage what we have to help those who are in need. And the beauty of it all is that when this happens and when God grants the body of Christ to live in harmony with one another, together with one voice, we can glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it will all be for the glory 
of God. I'm happy that a few of you got jazzed up by that and excited about that because I think that that is a beautiful, grand, and glorious vision. I don't believe that there can be very many other visions that are more beautiful and more compelling and more glorious. But as I heard about the story of those unbelievable people who united together to rescue and save those people who were stranded, I couldn't help but think about the many boaters and boat owners who heard the call for help but ignored it. I couldn't help but think, I'm sure there were some people who instead of going to help someone in need, they drifted away into the safety of their comfort and convenience. I wonder how many boats received the call, but they decided to head in the opposite direction of those who were in need. That when they could have easily done something, they said, no, I'm not going down there. I'm going up here to safety. I doubt that it was just those who had luxurious yachts that went the other way. But I suspect that maybe even someone who didn't have a large boat, but perhaps they had a smaller boat with that little engine in the back. that They didn't know the engine that could. (laughs) And perhaps they thought their boat was older or their boat was a little bit raggedy, but it was still working. And because of that, because it was raggedy and old and and not that pretty, they thought that their help wouldn't really matter. So they decided to keep their boats docked instead of doing what they could to help someone with what they had. See, I think that with the way our world is going, more and more people are probably settling to either head in the opposite direction of what the where there is help needed or they're deciding to keep their boats docked instead of using what they have to help someone else. But when we do that, what is missed is the grand opportunity to display something glorious and extraordinary by foregoing our own pleasures and comforts. By not just looking out for our own interests and self ser- serving ourselves, but to serve someone else, to sacrifice for the sake of others. And this is why I feel this day is so important for us as a local church to cast and to recast this vision that in Christ. Together, we are triumphant. I thought y'all would talk to me a little bit better than that. In the fragile world that we live in, that is becoming ever polarized, it has become increasingly needed for us to be counterculture as a church and to be a church that brings people together in Christ to make disciples of Christ for the glory of Christ. And with today's passage that we're looking at in Romans chapter 15, we see a unique aspect of this vision of togetherness. Because in it, we see a vision of how our togetherness displays the glory of God. See, as many of you know, today marks 10 years of us together as pastor and people. And on the first Sunday of November 2012, I had the honor and privilege of being installed as the lead servant here at the Triumphant Baptist Church. And a year later, as the first Sunday of November 2013 was approaching, I sensed it was important for me to use the first Sunday of November every year to remind us what we are about as a church, as pastor and people. Because every year when this time comes around, I have to be honest, it's a time for me to take inventory, to take take a, a temperature of where we are And what have I done as a pastor? But I've also wanted it to be a time for us collectively to recalibrate and take inventory corporately, making sure that we're not just doing church, but that we are being the church. That we understand and remember that when we say together we are triumphant, it's not just 
to be something that we say or a mantra that we just imprint on a t-shirt or a motto that we motto that we just frame and put on a wall. No, that's not what it's about. But that it becomes something that we are expressing and living out and maintaining in our everyday lives. Because here's what John Maxwell says. Vision leaks. I would also add that not only does vision leak, but if you don't keep it fresh, eventually vision will fade as well. You can look around at some people's shirts this morning and you can see that vision fades. Matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why I want us to wear these T-shirts every year because it's a physical demonstration for us to see how vision fades and how every now and then we need a fresh new shirt. My friend, Reverend Dr. Charlie Dace, he pointed out in one of his sermons that there is a prominent university that when it was established in 1636, it only hired professors that were Christians. And it had a mission statement that said it was founded, listen, y'all, to instruct students to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And this same university that started in 1636 with this mission statement, it now graduates more atheists and agnostics than it does believers. Because if you're not careful, vision will fade. Can you guess what school that is? Harvard University. He also points out an organization that when it was founded, it began with a purpose of training and commissioning Christian missionaries. And over the years, though, as they expanded, their vision began to fade. And eventually, the YMCA, which stood for Young Men's Christian Association, started to only be known for health and fitness with no reference to Christ. And in 2010, they officially dropped three of the four letters, and they are no longer known as the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. They are now just known as the Y. And as Reverend Dr. Charlie Day says, now you have to read that and you have to ask yourself, why? As I heard Richard Stern, who is the president of Emeritus of World Vision, say last week, we lose our way when we lose our why. And triumphant, I don't want us to lose our why. Here's something very important, folks. I want us to remember and know that this isn't simply our church's vision. This is God's vision for the church. I want you to know that we haven't just conjured this up from spending time by ourselves trying to come up with some creative and catchy slogan. No, we, we were able to do that, but that's not really the impotence of it. I have a relic here. This, 10 years ago, was handed to me. This is the baton that was handed to me when I became the lead servant of the Triumphant Baptist Church. And over these past 10 years, as this baton was handed on to me, I have been try, I've tried to commit myself to making sure that this is our guide. Yes. Yes. And I know that it is from the pages of this holy word that we understand and we know that the word translated for church in the scriptures is the word what? Ecclesia. Thank goodness two folks know. Ecclesia, which if you translate it literally, we now translate it church, but if you were to translate the, word, translate the word ecclesia literally from the Greek to the English, it would be the word gathering. And so that's why we say to gather, we are triumphant. Because it's right from God's word. This is God's idea. Church was not man's idea. Gathering together wasn't something that man came up with. It was something that God came up with. In fact, there is no church without some gathering together. You cannot be the church 
if there is not some gathering together. And we can't get away from that. Even with our commitment to go and be a witness for God in all of the world, we have to know that it begins with gathering. That's why we say we gather to go be a witness in the world. So on this Sunday, as we gather again to be reminded from the scriptures that it is in Christ that together we are triumphant. I want you to know that the vision of togetherness is not something that I came up with. It's interwoven and weaved throughout the New Testament, beginning in Acts chapter 2, when the church was established after the Holy Spirit was poured out. From there on, you see woven through the New Testament this idea of unity, this idea of togetherness, this idea of gathering as a local church. And for the last 10 years, I've been pointing to it all throughout the scriptures so that we stay on vision. This morning for Romans, we see a unique aspect of this vision, though, because the vision in this scripture, that, excuse me, that this scripture lays out for us, it is a glorious vision. It should be one that every believer in Christ should desire and aspire to. It should be a vision that is compelling and a vision that we long and crave for. A glorious vision of how togetherness within the body of Christ brings glory to God. But notice how Paul begins as he lays out this glorious vision. This glorious vision of togetherness within the body of Christ, how it brings glory to God. I want you to notice who he puts the onus on right from the beginning. Do you remember? He starts out with, we who are strong have an obligation. He lays out this glorious vision of how togetherness within the body of Christ brings glory to God by putting the onus on the strong of the local church. He's addressing the mature saints. And in order to arrive at the glorious vision that he says will happen, he tells the mature saints, those who are strong in the faith, that they have, hear this strong imperative word, an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The Amplified Translation puts it this way. Those who are strong in our convictions and faith ought to patiently put up with the weaknesses of those who are not strong and not just please ourselves. Which we need to know that Paul doesn't just pick up with this theme in this first verse of chapter 15. In fact, some have suggested that the chapter breaks that we have here, y'all know that this was not in the original manuscript. The chapter breaks in the verses, it was just all one continuous little thing. And so when they put the chapter break here at 15, some people think that this is a poor chapter break because they think that chapter 14 should actually extend all the way down to perhaps verse 7 or verse 13 because I want you to listen to how Paul starts chapter 14 off with. He says, as for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So he has been developing, actually even from chapter 12, and building up this case about how the strong of a local church should be embracing the weak of the local church and bearing with them and that through that togetherness, you can build up to the glory of God. I don't have time, but I will just look at chapter 12 if you have your Bible. Verse number 10 tells us to love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Verse 18 says, live in harmony with one another. Verse 17 says, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Verse 18 says, live peaceably with all. Listen, he is building up this case 
And it's almost like it comes to a climax at chapter 15, verse 1, when he says, you who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. See, I know that theoretically, we know that the church will have some believers who are not as mature and weaker in the faith. But often, based on the conversations that I have with y'all, with y'all, with y'all, it seems we expect everyone within the local church to be spiritually mature and strong in their faith. That's what we expect, even though theoretically we know that that's not true. But that, that's how we act. Um, the pastor in New, New England, Ed Moore, he says it this way. He said, a church without weak people is a weak church. <laughs> Y'all know how good that is. Maybe you'll catch it on your way home. So here's the thing. As we consider this vision that Paul lays out here, I believe it should prompt us to see and to know why it's so imperative that we, and especially those of us who are stronger in our faith and more mature spiritually, have an obligation to sacrifice, to sacrifice even our preferences for the sake of others in a spirit of harmony, unity, and togetherness. So I'm going to lean on the mature saints this morning because the onus is on us. We have an obligation not to serve ourselves, for it not to be all about our preferences, that it would not be about our comforts and our convenience, conveniences, but that each of us, would not please ourselves, but please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Here's the thing. If we're going to live out this grand and glorious vision of togetherness to the glory of God, it means sacrificing. Not just looking to our own interests, and especially those of you who know you're spiritually mature. You know you're stronger in the faith. Those of you out there who are mature in your faith and you think everyone else should be where you are, Paul says to you, you have an obligation to bear with those who are weaker. You need to get your boat and go help out someone else that's in need. Another quote that I came across that was so good, Gavin Orton said that we must remember that the person sitting next to us at church may have had to muster up all their courage just to be here. And we look down at them in judgment. In fact, if you look at chapter 14, it keeps picking up this theme of passing judgment. It's not that we, as mature saints, cannot judge others in order to assess what their faith is like, but we don't pass judgment on them saying that you should be further along and so what's wrong with you? I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen, but I do appreciate those, that one um and that one amen. <laughs> those of us who are mature in our walk and stronger in our faith, we must have a commitment to not just be concerned with our own preferences, what pleases us and our desires. Hebrews 5 and 12 says it this, uh, this way, by this time you ought to be teachers and yet you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Some folks, they still want to be taught when they ought to be teaching. <laughs> Here, I'm not going to uh, try to do it. I, I'm going to make it plain by reading you something out of a book So because sometimes y'all hear from somebody else, you won't hear from me as a pastor. So, um, this book um, called I Am a Church Member by Tom Rainer. He talks about the tale of two members. There's these two gentlemen who were attending the same church, and they would meet every Monday morning for breakfast at 6 o'clock. And um, their names were, um, they weren't like our names, Michael and Liam. But they enjoyed their time together. And then one Monday morning, um, they could tell, uh, Michael, he could tell that something was uneasy in the air. And so he asked Liam what was going on. Liam didn't take long to respond to get to the point. He said, 
Michael, Lana, and I have decided to leave the church. The pause seemed to last for minutes. Neither of them seemed to know who should speak next. Michael took the initiative and spoke softly and deliberately. Do you want to tell me about it? Michael inquired. He, he honestly didn't know if Liam wanted to say anything about it, but his friends seemed resolute. Nevertheless, Liam began to explain his feelings and his decision. Lana and I went to, to the church to learn deep truths about the Bible. But Pastor Rogers, I mean Robert, Pastor Robert is not feeding us. We're not getting anything out of the messages. We're sitting in the service on Sunday morning. It's, it just feels like a waste of time. Michael didn't respond initially. He could tell Liam had more to say. There are several great people in the church, Liam continued. You and Karen are some of the best, and there are a few more like you. He had paused, and his facial expression came more serious. But honestly, Michael, our church is full of hypocrites. Did you hear Jim at the kids' basketball game? He was, he was embarrassing me the way he was screaming at the refs. What kind of testimony is that for Christians? And of course, everyone knows about Neil. He was supposedly this pillar of the church, and we found out he's been cheating on his wife for over a year. What kind of church is this with these kind of people? If I could add parenthetically, it's, it's a real church. <laughs> Liam was angry but controlled as he continued to vent. Look, Pastor Robert acts like he cares for us. Pastor Rogers, I mean, Robert acts like he cares for us, but I'm not so sure he does. I told him that Lana's dad was in the hospital for hernia surgery, and he never visited him. Michael, the other gentleman, knew that Lana's father was not a church member and that he lived 50 miles away. He also knew that Pastor Robert called him and prayed with him but also knew that any rebuttal would, be, would not be appreciated at the moment. Michael held his tongue. Now, it seemed that Liam's rant was winding down, and Liam seemed exhausted, ready to bring the conversation to a close, and he did. However, uh, he offered a few pointed comments and two insightful questions. He said, Michael, I really like you and Karen and your kids. All of you are class act. He paused briefly, and he said, but you seem enthused about your church. You seem enthused. You keep serving and you keep contributing. And don't take me wrong. I wonder at times if you are blind to all the problems in the church. Then Liam offered a closing that really spoke more than he realized. We are really two different types of church members. Why is that? Why do we have such different perspectives? See, if you are the mature person, you want to grow deeper in the Lord? That's your opportunity to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. You, if you're that mature, you should be looking to see how you can teach someone else, how you can serve someone else how you can help someone who is weaker in the faith. Maybe they're not as mature as you are. Maybe they're going through a hard time and they need some encouragement. But if you are that mature, that you need the deep truth of scripture, you don't need more lessons. You need to teach what you've been taught. A sign of maturity is when you are able to disciple someone else based off of what you have learned. But in the church in America, it seems that the only thing that we think growing means is more lessons. But what good is the lessons if you're not teaching it to somebody else? That's not the way of Christ. We bring people together in Christ so that we can disciple people in Christ for the glory of Christ. More often, people need encouragement and not judgment and admonishment from us. Amen. Another quote. I got a whole bunch of quotes this morning. The judgmental heart owns a hundred microscopes and no mirrors. <laughs> and perhaps... We're not seeing that. 
our judgmental hearts is not exposing to us the areas in which we need to grow by being mature enough to help someone else out. That the church is going to have weak people, and if it doesn't have weak people, that's not a strong church. That's not a healthy church. Tim Keller, my second favorite preacher after Reverend Dr. Charlie Dates, he says churches should feel more like the waiting room for a doctor and less like a waiting room for a job interview. See, one group is all cleaned up, buttoned up, putting their best foot forward, wanting to make a good impression, trying to project confidence and competence. And sadly, that's what people feel like they have to do when they come to church. They feel like they got to come to church and put airs on and act like they got it all together when the truth is, we all in somebody's waiting room in need of some kind of help. You won't say amen about it, but I know it's true. But while one group is trying to put their best foot forward, another group perhaps is a bit disheveled in need of help, and they don't feel like coming to church is a place where they have to put on this facade that minimizes their weaknesses. They want to be able to come to a place where they can be candid about their brokenness and candid about their need for help. I was talking to someone this week who said, I know I need to come to church. Matter of fact, we were standing right back in there in this room. They said, I know I need to come in here because they know that they need help. They know that they need to go to the doctor's office, to the one who is the only one that can help them. But for too all, far too often, they feel like they got to come here and put on airs and act like they got it all together. This is where the broken should come to be healed. Where the blind come to see. Where the drug addict comes to be delivered and set free. This is where the lost should come to be found, where the brokenhearted should come to be mended, where marriages on the brink of disaster should come to be restored. This is the place where the sinner comes to be saved. This is the place. And it is here where you come to find peace, to find healing, to find hope, to find joy to find instruction and an endurance and encouragement that the scriptures can only provide. See, the next verse, verse number, not, not the next verse, verse number four, it tells us how what was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Here it is, is that when people come and the mature bear with the failings of the weak, they should come in this place to get instruction from God's word, to get what they need to continue to endure this race, to get the encouragement that they need to still have hope in this hopeless world. This is the place where you come to get that. They need to come to hear about how God called to Adam and ask Adam, where are you? even when Adam was trying to hide from God. They need to hear how after Sarah laughed God off because she thought she was too old for God to let her get pregnant, and God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And then in a year, she would give birth to Isaac when she thought she wouldn't be able to have a child. This is the place where they need to come to hear about how the Lord told Abraham to then sacrifice Isaac to the Lord. And that when he told him to do that, the Lord provided a ram in the bush. Because God always provides the demand for his own some source for his own demand. This is the place where people need to come and know that God is still choosing Davids who are out all the way in the field when people are overlooking them. Yes, yes. That God can see that you're a man after my own heart, 
even though you're not in the midst in the company of where other people would say God has something for you. This is the place where we need to go so we can see how he told Jeremiah, I knew you in your mother's womb. This is the place where people need to know that you can see like Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his glory filled the temple and he heard the angel saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the earth is filled with his glory. This is the place where they could come to see how Peter's name was changed from Simon to Peter when he thought that he had done such that he would never be loved by Jesus again. Jesus says, I still love you. And now that you have been converted, I want you to go and help somebody else. This is the place where we need to come and hear about how Paul was knocked down and given the bright lights and his eyes was covered. He was blind, but he was able to have the scales come down and to see that his ways were not of God. This is the place, y'all. That through instruction of God's word, we're given the strength to endure. We're given the encouragement to still have hope. To learn of the great old message that after 400 years of silence, God put himself in human flesh, came to earth, allowed him to be a true carpenter that did not just build chairs, but took wood and nails and saved the whole world through his life on the cross. This is the place that he didn't just die, but that on Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hands and then he ascended to heaven and our hope is sure that one day he is coming back again. This is the place where people come to get that message. Triumphant, we've got to make sure that we are the type of place for people like that, that our togetherness would be for the glory of God. For the glory of God. As we recalibrate today around our vision and our motto that in Christ together we are triumphant, I want you to know triumphant. I've been listening to you. I've been listening. Many of you have been talking to me and sending me emails. I've been listening to you. And I know we need to do a better job as a local church of putting systems in place that be, will be sustained to help us care on one another. I know that we need to have a system in place where the mature can have the opportunity to bear with the failings of the weak and not just to please ourselves. That we can care on one another and help those who are mature to step up to help those mature who are sitting on their gifts to begin to operate in their gifts to serve one another. So I'm going to work with our leaders. We're going on a leadership summit on Thursday, and we're going to come up with a care package where we can tap on the more mature among us to help us reach out and care on our members better. The pandemic has exposed a glaring need for us as a local church, that we need to shore up our systems to care on one another better. (laughs) Studies are beginning to reveal the plummeting of student achievement due in part to prolonged school closures during the pandemic, how they had to learn virtually. Studies are revealing that student achievement plummeted I'm sure, though, that if we did an equivalent study of the church closures and people who were using online church as a convenience and not a caution, that it would reveal some decline in the spiritual health of members as well. And the thing is, is that because of the pandemic, it's been difficult getting a sense of how people are doing spiritually. It's one of the reasons why... I need you to come to church so I can see you and look in your eyes and see how you're doing. Because I can look in your eyes and tell when I need to lift you up in prayer this week. I saw somebody this morning, looked in their eyes, and I said, oh, yeah, they need some prayer this week. 
You need to come to church so that other people can see and pray with you. And you need to come to church so you can see who you need to pray for. So how will we do this? I'm going to be calling on those who are stronger in the faith, those who are more mature, to help in this area. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to be working with our leaders this week, but one thing that we're going to do is beginning 2023, at the beginning of the year, we're going to roll out a digital directory so that we can care on one another better and be able to contact one another. We need to do what we're called, what I'm going to call a census to make sure we have all of your information, that your information is up to date, that we know how many people are in your household, that we know where your children go to school, we know how old they are, so we have all of that information. And so you're going to be getting a phone call over the next couple of months to get a census of your information. Expect the phone call, but I want you to know why we're doing it. We're doing it so that we can care on one another better, so that together, We can build this for the glory of God. So we're going to do a census, and at the beginning of the year, we're going to roll out a digital directory. But we're also going to use this time to get a sense of how we're doing spiritually. We're going to get a sense of the spiritual temperature of our church. We're going to try to get a sense from you where you are in your commitment to this local church. Whether or not you've decided to take your boat somewhere else. Because it's been hard to get a sense. And I'm going to be relying on the mature of us, not in a judgmental way, to help lead in this effort that we can care on one another well. But we will also use this as a way to assess what gifts are lying dormant and how can we provide opportunities for people to use and operate in their gifts more effectively. So it's a three-pronged approach. We're going to get a census so that we can get the information, but we're also going to get a sense for where you are spiritually and connected to our church, but we're also going to get an assessment of what gifts might you have that you can provide to the church if we provide opportunity. And I want to thank those of you who prodded me in this area, and I want you to know that I've been listening. I haven't forgotten. I heard you. Because... It's not just my ideas that matter. It's your ideas too. We are pastor and people. Together we are triumphant. So I've been listening to you. I hope some of you in the room know who I'm talking about. Because if you think I'm talking about you, I am. Because you prodded me. You sent me an email. You called me. You met with me. You gave me an idea. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. Because through it, we're going to display the glory of God like never before. I want us to create a church, if I could use the song that I used the first Sunday in November 2013, because sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. You want to go where people know that people are all the same. That, that, that's what this day is about. And the world that we're living in right now that is so fractured, that is so polarized, that's so individualistic, we need to be a church where the mature will bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. And if you need some inspiration, if you need the impotence for this, look at verse number three. For Christ did not please himself. You want to know your inspiration for not taking your boat and going somewhere else? Because Christ didn't even please himself. He didn't even just do things for his own preferences. I wonder, did Christ ever go to the synagogue and they were singing a song that he did not necessarily like, but he sang it anyway? I wonder if Christ ever got upset because when he would go to children's church on Sunday, he would know everything and he was saying, this children's church youth department ain't nothing. No, that's not what Christ did. 
He did not please himself. And if you need inspiration, you better look to Christ. Because there may be some of you who think your boat is too raggedy, that you don't have much to offer. Or there are others of you who you're, you're not feeling, you're not really feeling about like sacrificing this. I don't know about that, Pastor. I'm not sure about sacrificing in this way. I like my, I like what I like. Paul tells the mature to look to Christ. If there's ever any true inspiration, it should be Christ. Not only is he our inspiration, but he is the impotence who gives us the power and the strength to be able to do this. Because Christ not only died, but rose again, the scriptures tells us if you believe in Christ, that same power lives in me and you. That same power. So don't look to your own strength to do it. Look to Christ to do it. He is our inspiration, but he is also the impotence. He is the one who gives us the power to do it. His spirit lives in you to help you do this, to help us do this. And when we do it, our togetherness can put on God's glory and show it off in such a way that the whole world would be amazed. You want to know how we get folks in this room? When they see us loving on one another like it is impossible to do without Christ. When we put God's glory on full display, people all across this region, all across this world, They'll be able to say with us that together we are triumphant.